So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the public lecture at Phoenix 15. So the Phoenix project has been stretching back over more than a decade now, and it's done some fairly revolutionary things in the field of scientific computing by taking the coding away and allowing people to write maths, reason about maths, and generate the results automatically. It's led on to a whole bunch of interesting projects, including the Dolphin Adjoint and Fidrate projects that both came out of Imperial College. So in many respects, the person around whom this has revolved over the last 10 years is Professor Anders Log. Anders Log has led the Phoenix Project essentially since its inception and is now Professor of Computational Mathematics at Chalmers University in Sweden. And he's going to now address us on the subject of implementing mathematics for the next about 45 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for that, uh, I would say, overly generous uh, introduction. And, and thanks for inviting me to this, this uh, wonderful uh, workshop here in, uh, in London. So I will talk about implementing uh, mathematics, domain-specific languages, and automated computing. And I have to be standing here because of some issues with uh, the pointer. Um, so first, some collaborators. Uh, the Phoenix project is due to many people, most of whom are in this room at this moment. Uh, I'll talk about the einstein vlasov equations, and I have some collaborators at Chalmers for doing that. I'll talk about uh, uh, something about finite out of exterior calculus and functional programming and for that I also have some collaborators at the uh, CS department at Chalmers in Gothenburg. So, implementing mathematics is my first part of this talk. So, how do we solve problems in science and engineering? And from my perspective, I'm someone who solves equations. Uh, science consists of two, th two steps. One is to formulate problems or equations and the second step is to solve equations. And most of us in this room, we are world-leading experts on, on the second step. And then the question is, how do we... Well, let, let me show some examples first. So here's an example of an equation, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. And here is a solution of the uh, Navier-Stokes equations. Here is another equation that we will we'll be solving later in this talk, the Einstein field equations. And here's a solution of, of those equations. <laughs> and... How then do we go about approaching the second step, solving equations? Well, it's, it has two steps, right? One is to invent a clever algorithm, and the second one is to express this algorithm as computer code in your favorite language. This is how we do it currently. So to solve this equation, what do we do to solve this equation? Well, let's look at a few examples of how people normally solve this equation. To solve this equation, someone had to write this code. And the resolution here is quite, quite small. Um, so if you look at this closely, it's a piece of Fortran code I found on the web for, um, for solving the Poisson problem. It has 2,500 lines of Fortran 77 code. This is how you solve the Poisson problem. And if we look at this here, we can directly say that this is obviously the, not the right way to solve this problem. Or it's a good way, but you cannot look at this code here and say, this is how it should be done. We don't need to think about this again. This is how it should be done. You cannot say that. So let's look at another example. Here's another way to uh, solve the Poisson problem. <laughs> this is from the Petsy tutorial. So it's uh, reduced in size by a factor 180. It's a very good piece of code, but you will not look at this code and say, this is how it should be done, right? And another example. Here is a tutorial from DL2. <laughs> and looking at this code again, you will not say that this is the way to do it, right? Because you look at these things, you have what you have. You have uh, things like um, get Dauphin disease. You have, you have to create a Doff handler uh, with some template arguments. You have to worry about things like fe values dot v in its cell. There's another Doff handler make sparsity pattern, stuff like that. So I would say this is also not the way to solve Poisson's equation. Well, it's one way to do it, but it's not the optimal way or the right way. So there are obvious problems with these approaches. And uh, the main problem is that the implementation is an obfuscation of the mathematics. It's, there's no way to look, to look at the code and say, this comes from the Poisson problem. Well, if you're experienced, you can figure it out, but it's not an obvious um, map going from the code back to the equation. 
Uh, and code is costly to write and maintain per line of code. So we have to minimize uh, the number of lines of code. And we have this obvious disconnect between the mathematics. Here's the equation. And this corresponds to very many lines of code. So we want to get good away from this. And we should point out that all these examples are really good programs, well-polished programs written by excellent people, excellent programmers, excellent mathematicians. So still, the programs look like something that is not the ideal way to solve the Poisson problem. Then someone might say, well, this is a solution, code generation. If you have this clever idea to generate code, you can say, I have a form compiler. And into that form compiler, I feed the equation. And I get this nice code. And very many more lines of code. And then you can run this code, compile the code, run the code, and you get your solution. So you can think about this as the solution to the problem. You write the Poisson problem, and then you uh, generate the code. And here's a recipe for code generation. You invent your domain-specific language, which allows you to express your problem very compactly in your mathematical notation. Then you generate the code, and you get something very nice and pretty like this. And from this, you generate the code. This is what we do in the Phoenix project. However, to make this possible, to write down the Poisson problem in one line of code, and then generate these tens of thousands of lines of code, someone had to write this. So this is Nedelec's second kind uh, from FIA. So we have 5,616 lines of Python in, in Fiat. And again, if you look at this code, you will say, well, this is also not the way to do it. What does this mean? Offset, what is that? Non RTS dot face, and so on. And you have some phi's, and you have a face Jacobian, maybe that's good. You have some strange phi table up there that no one understands. So, yes. Yeah, but I mean, I'll get to them. <laughs> that, that, that's not a valid argument, because I have another slide. This is uh, monomial integration.py from FFC. And this is clearly not uh, something we want to look at and revisit. I haven't looked at this code for very many years. I'm very happy. It took me a long time to write. It's very complicated. It's a complicated algorithm that Rob figured out. I, I could make sense of it, I could implement it, but I don't want to look at this code again. We have this very nasty E table and the Psi table and they index e into each other and I don't really understand it anymore. So there are obvious problems with this approach as well. Because, well, you, get, you reduce the number of lines of code per user. A user has to write one line of code. But still, the developers have to write uh, the same amount of code or more. So the complexity grows, the maintenance costs, they grow. And it's not sustainable. Because how many people in the world understand monomial integration.py? And the answer is less than two, maybe less. So what happens if something goes wrong? Well, people write new form compilers. They understand their form compilers for a while, but what happens then, next time, uh, when they look back at their code five years later? They will also run into these problems. So we just move the problem somewhere else. We reduce it by factor the number of users, but it's still a, a challenge to maintain large and complex pieces of software. So then the solution is to don't invent clever algorithms and don't write code. You write mathematics instead. You should not write code. You should not invent clever algorithms. You should write mathematics. And then you can just express your computation as mathematics and collect the results. But is this realistic? Well, maybe not now, but this is an ideal that we should strive for and try to um, find a good compromise between what we would really like to do, which is just to define the mathematics and let the math mathematics figure itself out and give us a solution. It sounds strange, but I will show some examples in the end where we can actually try to do th something like this. We just write down the mathematics. We don't think about clever algorithms. And once we have written down the mathematics, we never have to revisit it again. Because the mathematics doesn't change. A function is a function. A real number is a real number. So we can write it down once and 
then it's fixed. So I will, I'm not claiming that I've done this or that I will be doing this in the next few years, but I'm saying this is what we should do in the next hundred years. And I will give some examples of projects that strive in this direction. So first the Phoenix project, then the einstein vlasov equations, and uh, this new uh, nice project that we have started on implementing finite element exterior calculus. So the Phoenix project, many people in this room are part of the Phoenix project. There are others who don't know anything about the Phoenix project, so I have a short introduction to Phoenix. It's a big and, and uh, widely used uh, C++ Python library with uh, uh, contributors from around the world. Uh, maybe I should also include our friends here, uh, colleagues, competitors at, at uh, Imperial to contribute also to the Phoenix project and uh, very good uh, they host this conference and so on. Uh, but it's a big uh, and widely used uh, finite element library. You can use it in Python, you can use it in C++ to solve uh, PDs of uh, very many types and do it efficiently on big machines. So the key features of Phoenix is, uh, well, it's all about automation. So you, we want to automate everything that you have to do in order to solve PDs using finite elements. So this goes in the direction of specifying or writing down the mathematics. If everything in mathematics has a counterpart in our code, then the code becomes the same thing as the mathematics. So the code is the mathematics, if we do it the right way. And as we saw, the whole of Phoenix does not follow this principle. This only holds for very small, tiny pieces of Phoenix. The rest of Phoenix is a large implementation of very clever algorithms invented by many people. And we do all these things that we expect, uh, parallelism, high performance, linear algebra, very many different elements, and so on. And you can, you can uh, find very good documentation and solve very many PDs using Phoenix. And another way to look at Phoenix, what we want to do with the Phoenix project, is to think about automated scientific computing. So we want to build a system where um, this is the input and this is the output. So normally you write a solver for a particular problem, like the Navier-Stokes equations. And then maybe you can set some parameters, some tolerances for your solver. You get a solution, you can change the mesh, you can change the boundary conditions, maybe some material parameters. But with Phoenix, uh, the equation itself is input. You say, I want to solve this equation, two within this tolerance, and then you should get out the solution to this PD, an approximate solution, and it should be correct to within some given tolerance, the one that you specify. So this is what we want to do in Phoenix. And we do that by breaking down this automation process into steps. So first we take, we take the equation and we discretize the equation. And the discretization is automatic. So we automatically translate using the finite element method, the PD into a linear or nonlinear system of equations that we can then feed into PETC or your favorite solver. That's the second blue box there that we have not worried so much about in the Phoenix project. Then we have this feedback loop that after we have computed the solution, we can check the solution, uh, the quality of the solution, the accuracy. And if the accuracy is not good enough, it doesn't satisfy the tolerance, which is also input, the tolerance and the equation. Then we change the discretization. We break the um, um, discretizing pieces into smaller pieces. We increase resolution to automatically meet this, this given tolerance criterion. So, um, automated discretization. This is one of the key things in Phoenix. This is something that we did early. So, you can write down your PDE, or a variation form of a PDE. You give it to the form compiler, and you get code. And this works really well. So, this relies on having a domain-specific language that you can use here, having a form compiler, and then a system at this end that can take care of the code for you, compile it, link it up with other pieces that you need, and compute solutions efficiently. Then automated error control. So here's another thing that we did. Um, you can write a complete Navier-Stokes solver in Phoenix for a static problem in less than 40 lines of code, including boundary conditions, including loading in the mesh, post-processing, and so on and it's fully adaptive, and it's fully automatic. So if you just run this, this is a demo in Phoenix. So if you run this demo, it runs in 10 seconds on my, on my laptop. 
uh, and it gives us an accuracy which is 10 to the minus 4. And if we try to do the same thing using uh, uniform refinement, it requires instead of 15,000 degrees of freedom, it requires a million degrees of freedom. And last time I checked, a few years ago, it took several hours to run this. I had to break it because I didn't want to wait. So with 15,000 degrees of freedom, you get a better solution than with a million. And it only takes uh, 10 seconds, and it's fully automatic. You don't have to write this, this uh, complex algorithm for doing adaptivity. It's all automatic, and these 10 seconds includes the automatic generation of the dual problem, and the, um, well, it doesn't include form com com for compilation, but it includes the automatic generation of the error indicators and so on, uh, the full 10 refinement levels and so on. It's a very good example of, of how far we can get with, with automation. And here's a simple example of solving a PDE in, in Phoenix. So this, is a very, this has been a very successful interface, and I think uh, the reason it has been so successful is that we try to mimic the mathematics. So you have things like function spaces. You have things like trial functions, test functions. You have mathematical operators like the gradient, integration. And then we say solve, and we get the answer, and we plot the solution. So this is a complete uh, Poisson solver. And it's not loading in uh, some predefined, pre-written uh, Poisson solver from a library. You're specifying here that I want to solve this exact problem. And you can change it and solve infinitely many different PDs in, 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 uh, in this framework. And here's another example, uh, a more complex problem, where I've just included the piece where we specify the mathematics and the variation problems. You can do quite complex elastic models also with Phoenix, just specify the mathematics, and we see that it's very close to the mathematics. It's hard to get any closer to the mathematics than we get here. So, if you want to know more about the Phoenix project, you can go to the Phoenix project webpage. And, and for those of you in the audience, um, remember to, that you can, you can contribute things to this slideshow. It's a very good way to, if you write a new paper, you advertise it on a web page, people go to our web page, they see we do something new. You get sort of likes, so you get people to look at your paper because you put something on a web page. We have many visitors, they will go to this article, read about your stuff, and maybe go to archive and, and read your preprints. Pre so we're transmitting live from, 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 from the conference in this Twitter feed. Okay, so this, this was my introduction to Phoenix. So let's now move on to these um, other topics I want to talk about. So the einstein velocity equations. So first, uh, a one-page introduction to general relativity. So it's, we don't really need to understand uh, the equations for, for this talk, but I'll just quickly uh, step through some basic facts about general relativity. So it models space-time as a four-dimensional manifold. So X, Y, Z in space, you can think about that, which has a metric. Okay, so we live in this four-dimensional space-time, and we have something called the metric in the space-time. And the metric, what it does, it measures small distances between points in space-time, so four-dimensional points. What is the distance between them? And then you can look at things like curvature, because from this metric, you can compute what is the curvature of space-time at this point in space and time. And this relates to things like, okay, the curvature, this is an equation for the free fall of a particle, uh, Newton's first law, if you don't push anything uh, or affect it with forces, it will continue along a straight line. The same thing in general relativity, but the metric defines what a straight line is. It follows sort of, if you look at a globe, you have these geodesics when you uh, go on an airplane. It's sort of the same thing with, with space-time. You have these geodesics uh, followed by particles in, 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 free, in free fall. And then how do you compute this me metric? Well, it's related to the energy and matter distribution in the universe through something called the Einstein field equations. And you can write these down like this. This is the famous cosmological constant. So here we have an equation for a tensor G, which is the metric, and it's determined by 
this equation. So this is the left-hand side. This is minus, minus Laplace on of U. This is F. F is the matter distribution, which depends in some way on, on energy, matter, and it also depends on the metric. So the, 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 the equation for the, for the matter will depend on the metric. So it's a coupled system. And if you write this down, it's a very compact notation. If you write, write this down, you'll get something that expands to 10 uh, couple nonlinear PDs that you can then try to solve uh, together with constraints and so on. So these are the equations that we try to solve using Phoenix. And here's a solution. This is uh, a galaxy called NGC 6744, which is believed to be very similar to our own galaxy, um, the Milky Way. So this is our own galaxy, and this galaxy is then a solution to the Einstein equations. Here's another solution, something called the Hogue object. This was spotted by the Hubble Space Telescope. And since this exists, it has to be a solution to the Einstein equations. And we can try to come up with that solution. And it works the other way around. People can try to solve the Einstein field equations, and if they find a solution, then they can argue this must exist. So someone found a solution to uh, the Einstein equations, and therefore there must be black holes. There must be a big bang and so on, because I found this as a solution to the equations. So therefore, it can exist. So it's interesting to solve these equations because if you do, if you do solve the Navier-Stokes equations, well, you know something will flow around. But if you solve these equations, it's exciting because you will get something. And if you get something funny or interesting, it, it, it's, it's science because you don't know what the solution will look like. Here's another. It's very hard to see here. Um, so Chris helped me uh, do this. Uh, a few days ago. Uh, this is using the point cloud output from, from Phoenix. The, the what? It's not easy. No. So you can see this is, um, this is, the solution is not really rotating. I'm rotating the, rotating the camera in Paraview. But it's, it's a, a static solution to the Einstein equations. So it's a torus-shaped galaxy of stars that comes out when we solve the Einstein equations. So what about matter models? Well, when you solve the Einstein equations, you have to couple them to a model for your matter. And, and usually people use uh, elastic models and, and, and fluid models. So we have this right-hand side in the Einstein equations, the T that depends on the metric somehow. Uh, and a promising alternative that we uh, work with is, is um, kinetic models. So you can think about the Boltzmann equation, uh, the Vlasov equation, and so on. Um, so we model the galaxy as a collisionless gas, and that's a quite good approximation. If the, the stars are far apart and they don't collide very often, we can think about a galaxy as a collisionless gas. So then we can solve the Vlasov equation here for F. And what is F? Well, F is the distribution of stars. So it depends not only on T and X, but also on P, the momentum. If you put in, if you select a time, a position, and a momentum vector, then you can get, put this into F, and you can see how many stars have this exact property. How many stars at this point in space-time have this momentum? Or what is the density of those? Then we can solve the Einstein equations, and we see, so we can solve the Vlasov equation, and this thing here, the Christoffel symbols, they will depend, they can com be computed from the metric. So it's a coupled system. We solve the Einstein equations, and we solve the Vlasov equations, and we can iterate between those two. Well, actually, we don't do that, which I will come to in the next slide. So, the, the, the game you play when we, so, when we work these kinds of problems is that you make an ansatz for the metric. You say, okay, let's uh, think about the metric like this. So, it's, 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 it's a symmetric uh, matrix, the, the matrix. It has this quadratic form, and you can write it down like this, and you can say, okay, have some parameter nu and mu and uh, b, and omega. These are my unknowns in the metric. I assume the metric looks like this. I put this into the Einstein equations. So we now make an assumption that we have axial symmetry. So the galaxy has axial symmetry, um, and it, but it can rotate. But the rotation is constant, and it's time independent. But then it turns out that if you make an ansatz for the right-hand side, or the distribution in the Einstein equations, in terms of the energy and the angular momentum, you automatically satisfy the Vlasov equations. So that's a, that's a very big simplification. So we can, if, as long as we make an ansatz here that depends only on the energy 
and the angular momentum. We don't have to solve the Vassal equations. We only need to solve the Einstein equations. It will still be a very nonlinear system that we have to iterate to solve, but we can forget about the Vassal equations. So that's the setup. Then we can play with different kinds of ansatzes for, 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 uh, for the matter. And by, by choosing different ansatzes, by, by tuning these parameters, we can find interesting galaxies. So here are then the equations. This is, uh, these are the Einstein field equations for, so for axial symmetry, uh, uh, static, uh, we, um, and rotating. We have these four equations. So four coupled PDs for these four scalar fields in 2D. So it's a 2D problem um, on a half annulus, and we have uh, uh, oh, sorry, I said half disk, and uh, we have four different fields and they couple through this nonlinear system. But then it's more complicated than this because you have, these, you have these expressions here, these coefficients, the phi's. So what are the phi's? Well, they are defined as these integrals. So it's an integral differential equation. We have to compute some integrals in order to compute the right-hand side in our problem. So how do we do that with Phoenix? Well, here's the uh, left-hand side. In, in UFL. So it's quite easy. We just, just move everything which is not the Laplacian to the right-hand side. So then the left-hand side becomes easy and we have some axis symmetry so it looks a bit strange but this is the left-hand side Poisson part of the Einstein equations. And we'll get to that later. And these are the right-hand sides. So it's a bit more messy but you can just write this down from, from the paper. These are the equations. And you have these fields here, these phi's, which I call P. And how do we compute these? Well, this is the uh, abstract way of writing the equations. So you have the Einstein equations here for the U. U is the metric that we want to compute. But it, at every point X in space, the right-hand side depends on U at that point. And it's an integral over Rn, or R3, uh, over the momentum P. So we implement this in Phoenix by uh, defining these guys as expressions. So in Phoenix Python, you can inject C++ code. So for those of you who know Phoenix, you can have an expression. You can define it in terms of a piece of C++ code. And then we do numerical integration for a very simple scheme for computing these integrals. And then we do fixed point iteration. So we iterate over the equations, gauss seidel types. You solve one at a time. A the right hand side, left hand side, we solve. And then we have to do this trick. So before we did this, it didn't converge. So we have to rescale the mass in each iteration to preserve the mass of the galaxy. Otherwise, it would run away somewhere else. But with this trick, it converges uh, quite nicely. And topics of interest are to look at, for example, there are some inequalities in general relativity. We can see, test numerically, uh, is this conjecture uh, true? Well, if we find a solution that is, does not agree with this conjecture, it's probably false. So we can find out nice things about, about these galaxies. We can compute so-called rotation curves and, and, and say uh, um, spectacular things maybe about dark matter, its existence or no existence. And you can, as we do now, we can use this to predict and, and reproduce the interesting galaxies that we found on, find on the web or from the Hubble t Space Telescope. So here's one solution. This is... Um, Simplified model of Lasso Poisson uh, equation, uh, but we can do the same thing with the Einstein Lasso equation. So here are some disks. This is a nice shape to it. This is a disk shaped galaxy. Uh, this here is a torus shaped galaxy. So these are uh, isosurfaces of the density. And then we can, if that works out well, we can, from this, we can compute something like this. And because of the resolution of the projector, can't really see. There's a lot of stars here. So this is uh, overlaying these stars of the galaxy uh, computed from the density uh, with this isosurface for the galaxy. And again, it's not really rotating. I'm just doing this visualization to make it look a bit cooler than it actually is. It's a 2D problem, but I can visualize it as a rotating time-dependent 3D problem to impress you. But this is a solution then of the einstein glass equations. And on to my next topic. So, I will talk about implementing uh, finite element exterior calculus in, 
maybe not in Phoenix, but, but in, in some language. So uh, I will not go into a very long introduction to, to exterior calculus, but let me say it's, it's a way to view uh, finite element basis functions not as, not as scalar fields or vector fields, but instead as a mathematical object called differential form. So instead of spaces of vector functions, you have spaces of differential forms. And they sort of capture and generalize the properties of vector spaces and, and, and scalar fields from vector calculus. When you do that in this, this, this very long and, and, and uh, good paper, you can define, the authors they define these spaces as, as special, um, very good spaces of differential forms which have some parameters, and then you can obtain all or many of the, the, the elements that we, that we love as special cases of these, these, these elements here. So you choose a special R, you choose a special K, and a special dimension, then you get something like the BDM elements, or the Lagrange elements, or the DG elements, as special cases of these elements. And you can also obtain some, some other, some new elements that you haven't seen before as other special cases. And if you haven't seen this table, you can go to this web page where we have an online version of this table uh, which lists all these elements uh, for these four families of spaces for degree uh, 1, 2, and 3 in 1D, 2D, and 3D. So you can find, for example, the uh, Nedelec edge elements and the Nedelec face elements as special cases of these general families of elements. So instead of, of, of looking at the uh, Rob's Nedelec second kind dot pi. We would go into this table here and say, here are the Nedelec second kind elements in this table here. So that, that's the aim here, to, to, to be able to not having to look at, 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 at complex Python code, but to say, give me this element here. And what's, this, what's the definition? Well, the definition of is up here. So this is the code. Then people have, have implemented uh, parts of this uh, in, in, in various ways. Uh, so it's uh, obviously implemented in fiat, maybe not explicitly, but it's, it's there in fiat. We have Finat, this new uh, and, and shiny uh, finite element backend. Uh, Kent and I did something back in 2008. Uh, we tried to implement this. We did implement this in Python, but we never did anything about it. But it's a proof of concept implementation in Python. But we tried to follow this idea of not writing code, but instead writing mathematics. And there's some other uh, PyDeck software. I don't know the status of this, but it came out uh, a few years back. And okay, so before we continue with how do we implement this, let's remember these things. You should don't invent clever algorithms. You should don't write code. You should write mathematics. So how do you write mathematics? Well, you use functional programming. So we use functional programming, and the goal is to implement uh, finite element exterior calculus in Haskell. And, um, well, as an exercise, as a proof of concept, if it works out well, it can actually be used to compute basis functions for Phoenix, maybe. But that's not the, the main aim of this. The main aim is to see how far can we get with this idea of implementing or writing mathematics instead of writing code. So why Haskell? Well, there's a long list of reasons for why people would want to use Haskell. Um, the bottom line is, is that computer scientists, they love Haskell, and if I want to work with them, I have to use Haskell. Uh, but, but you can try to motivate this for yourself and say that, that it, it's, uh, it's mathematical, of course. You define what the thing is, not, 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 uh, not how uh, it becomes what it is. Uh, things are immutable, so if you write x equals something, it will actually be equal to x. It will not be equal to something else on the next line. Uh, it cares about types. It has a strong system for testing things. So you can do things like uh, testing the correctness of things. So we have in the code, you can say, okay, this thing should be anti-symmetric. Anti and you can define a property. It's anti-symmetric. And then it will be checked. Uh, it forces short, structured, concise programs. So it avoids hacks. So the good thing about Python is that you can easily sit down and write very many lines of code. So you can write uh, 100 or 200 lines of code of Python in an hour. Uh, but if you do this with Haskell, you can maybe write one line in one hour. But it has, it's a really good line of code. <laughs> uh, but, and this is good because you have to maintain the code right. And if, if, if you come up with the perfect line of code, it's there. You don't have to change it because it's perfect. 
Um, it has good support. It's also quite fast, so you don't have to worry about this being very, very slow. It's, it's, it's quite fast, actually. And why not Haskell? Well, it's very rare in use among, um, in this community. Very few people know about Haskell. I don't know Haskell. Um, but we can think about, maybe this is a natural progression. So people started with Fortran because, I mean, this was the only thing that you could, uh, could afford to use. Or before that, you have to write machine code because you c could not afford to use Fortran because the overhead was so large. And then people could start in the 90s to use C++ when it became better and you could afford to do C++. Then, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, people said, well, why not Python? Python is now so good. And now it's now so good that you can actually use this instead of C++, and you can generate pieces of C++ code and sneak this back into your Python library for efficiency. Well, maybe we should move to Haskell and rewrite all of Phoenix in Haskell for the next workshop. Well, it's, it's an idea. So let me give you a, a flavor of what Haskell is. So this is the, I, guess, I, would, I, I believe, the most commonly used uh, example when people want to, to, to explain how to do something in Haskell. And remember, I'm not a Haskell programmer, but uh, if we look here, this is how you explain or define mathematically the factorial function up here. You say that f is a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. I include 0 in the natural numbers f of 0 is equal to 1, f of n is equal to n times f of n minus 1. And you do the exact same thing in Haskell. You say f is a function from int to int. This thing here means has type, colon, colon. And actually in mathematics, colon also means has type. So f has type, f is something that takes n to n. f is something that takes int to int. So you could say that this is the definition of the factorial function, not that. This is equally valid. And maybe this is more valid, because this is exact. This is sort of sloppy. You can do whatever you want in mathematics, in LaTeX. You can write something. It doesn't, really, doesn't need to make sense. You can write symbols. It doesn't have to be valid mathematics. But here, if you do it in Haskell, it will be valid mathematics. So you could say this is the definition of the factorial function. So how do we then implement alternating forms in, in, in Haskell? Well, this is one way to do, uh, this is a, a toy example of implementing uh, differential forms or alternating forms really in, in, um, in Haskell. So alternating forms, they are differential forms that don't depend on x. So uh, the value of a basis function at a particular point is a uh, alternating form. So you can define something like the wedge product and, and you can actually then say I want I want this operator. This is uh, whiteboard pen. I, I, yeah. And <laughs> you want to define this operator, and and you can say, okay, let's 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 write it like this. Forward slash backslash. You can say that's an operator, and if w1 and w2, if they are one forms, then this product here should be a two form which means that you can apply this to two vectors. So v1 and v2, they will be vectors. And you can say what that is. Well, you should apply w1 to v1 multiplied by w2 to v2. So this is the this determinant that def defines this wedge product. And we can say, OK, here are some vectors, lists. Uh, you can define the dual basis. So what is a dual basis? Well, these are the most basic one forms. So dx1. What is that? Well, if v is equal to 5, 6, 7, then dx2 of v is equal to 6. It's the thing that picks out the second component. So dx1 is something that applied to a list of two things, picks out the first one. This picks out the second one. And this is a dummy thing. We don't worry about what is here. So it's pattern matching. If you apply this to something that looks like this, the result should be this. Good. And then you can do some examples. So I compute this wedge product. Now I have a two-form. And I can see what, it, what do I get if I apply this two-form to these two vectors. I get something. We can do this. So that's Haskell. But it gets even, gets even better. If you don't need to do this, you can use Unicode. So you can say, 
So this is also valid Haskell. So there's a Unicode for the wedge. So you can include that into your program. So you can write programs that are very mathematical because you can use all the symbols that you want. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, I mean, in Haskell you, you can, you can, it, it will infer the types itself. But if, if, you, if you are sort of a very strict uh, Haskell programmer, you would prefer to write the type of each function on the line. Of optional. Yeah, it's optional, yes. But it, it's a good thing to do because then it will be checked. So if I write this, this should be a function from this to this, and you write that, and you then do something, something stupid, we get the compiler error. But you can also opt to not write types, and Haskell will try as best, as, as best it can to figure it out for you. So it's statically typed, but it's, it's, it has inference of types. So finally, I will end by, by showing uh, pieces of the actual implementation of uh, finite element text calculus. So the status is that um, most of the things are implemented. We have uh, implemented uh, differential forms, simplices, subsimplices, finite element spaces, integration, differentiation, and so on. The things that we need in order to do finite element exterior calculus. So I will show some, some examples of... Um, I need a mouse. This one here. So, we'll, so first, let's look at how we implement simplices. So here is the implementation of, of simplex. So this looks like a, a, a technical report, but it's actually the implementation. So we can, there's something called literate Haskell, where instead of writing code with comments and then writing another document that tries to explain what's in the code, and it never gets updated, you can choose to write, uh, write mathematics. So this is a mathematical document that defines the code. So you can run this code. Well, I, I did run a little utility that from our, my .lhs file generated this PDF file. Generated LaTeX, uh, adding some boilerplate, then generating a PDF file. But you can actually run this code. So this is the actual code. And it's identical, identical with the mathematics. So let's see, what do we have? Well, we have a simplex. We have a nice figure. That's not part of the code, but it's part of the document. It explains the code. So that what is simplex? Data means sort of the same thing as class for us Python programmers. So we have a class or data type called simplex. It consists of two things. Sigma, which is a list of integers. So this means uh, list. And we have a list of vertices, which are points. And then a uh, full tetrahedron like this will consist of a list of four points and four indices, which are 0, 1, 2, and 3. But then you have a subsimplex, which could be this face here. That would be another simplex. It has the same vertices of length 4, this list of length 4. But it has an integer list, which is 0, 1, 3, that defines this subsimplex. So this is the data type for uh, simplices. And then you can do stuff like, while well, you have some constructors, you can create this, it says simplex, colon, colon means it has this type. It takes a list of points and gives us back a simplex. And it will uh, check that the dimension here um, of, of, of uh, the simplex matches, so the length of this list. So this is a full simplex, so it has to have a certain length. And it will then uh, go and create um, a simplex, this, following this, this uh, constructor defined above in the type definition. Two minutes, yes. Um, you can do things like implementing geometrical dimension. So it takes a simplex, it checks the first uh, point in the list, and it will return the dimension of that point as the geometrical dimension of the simplex. And we could add things like checking that all the points have the same dimension and so on. And you can do stuff like getting out subsimplices. You can integrate stuff over simplices. So this is the actual implementation. So I need to step one back. Can I do that? Good. And here's implementation of finite element space.
We have constructors for uh, the P spaces, the PR lambda minus spaces. We have some names for well-known elements, which are like aliases for, for these elements. And you can say that, okay, what is, here I can create uh, an RT space. If I say find element space RT and I give the degree and the simplex, it will check that the topological dimension of the simplex is two. Um, otherwise, give an error message. Otherwise, use this PRM LK constructor to give me uh, that um, space of differential forms. And yeah, you can include nice pictures in your, in your code and you can look at how we define the basis functions. So this follow this um, uh, geometric decomposition uh, where you have Whitney forms, uh, other strange uh, sigma is, 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 is uh, the mappings from increasing sets to increasing sets. The things that are defined in this paper, uh, geometric decomposition of, of uh, differential forms, you can define these things as they are written in the paper. And you can just write it down and explain it and once you've done this the correct way, you never have to touch it again. Well, that's, that's the ideal case. Of course, you have to touch it, but, but it's, 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 uh, it's another way to think about programming. Okay, so finally, I will um, end by the summary. Um, so, Phoenix automates finite elements by implementing finite elements or specifying finite elements in some way. Um, and I would say then the next step is to automate mathematics by implementing mathematics. Maybe in Haskell, maybe uh, in some other way. So we can probably write code that lives for 10 years, like monomial integration is still around, and some people use it. Uh, but can we write code that lives for 100 years? So we should sort of, um, if we are a bit more ambitious by factor 10, how do we write code that lives for, for a 100 years and is not dead uh, in two years' time when, when a new processor comes out and we have to rewrite and, and throw out all the code that we have. So don't worry about uh, clever algorithms. Worry about uh, writing the mathematics. And it might have a chance to live on. Okay, thanks. So thank you, Anders. Um, are there questions for Anders? And if there are, then I'll ask Anders to please repeat the question because otherwise the recording is not going to get it. So, uh, yeah, that yeah. are not obvious from the description of those spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, given that if you declare something, there may be more than one way to compute it, and mm -hmm. those ways yeah. may have very different costs yeah. in terms of being practical or not practical, mm -hmm. feasible or not. How would you allow people to describe their knowledge? Mm -hmm. Should I repeat that? So I, 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 so you ask about this. This, uh, I mean, this, this seems unrealistic because there, there is that there is a need for clever algorithms. You say, right? Because, I mean, if you do the stupid thing, it will take a factor one million more. So this is this is my ideal view. And in practice, we'll have to strike a compromise between what is ideal and what is practical. So certainly, there's there are these extreme cases like monomial integration of pi, that is extremely complex and gives us a factor speed up of, of 100 at that time compared to what, was, what existed. But since then, people have done more stupid things, which are, even in the simple cases, comparable in speed to um, what we did with this tensor contraction. So maybe in the long run, the stupid, things will, uh, will, the stupid uh, algorithms will win over the clever ones, because the clever ones are too, uh, too hard to understand and too hard to maintain. So. David. This is a question about the Einstein Blasov simulations. Some of your assumptions about the metric is that the solutions are stationary. Yes. And those kind of toroidal mass distributions in general are notoriously unstable. So, what would be really neat is if you could, after you found a solution, you could have a 
So, so it, it's a very interesting question. You ask about the stability of Tori in, in, in general relativity. What we found with our code is that we do this fixed point iteration. And it seems to want to find uh, stable solutions. So maybe our results say that these Tori are actually very stable. Because what happens when we play, I have this, I can show you at, at some point, I have this nice graphical user interface where I can play with these parameters. So we all have all these parameters and we, we compute some galaxy. We start with something simple. We try to uh, increase or decrease the values of some parameters to get to the extreme cases where we get very interesting solutions. Like we want to get really, really thin and flat disks. So these are the best disks that I can produce. If we try to make things more extreme by increasing parameters further, the solution will run away and, and become a torus. So from our simulations, it looks like tori's, uh, tori are actually very stable because it's indicated. I mean, it's a good thing that we could check its linearize, check the stability, but since our uh, solver converges to tori solutions, it's an indication that they are indeed stable because if we are very close, if we have some parameters for a disk that is very flat and we increase uh, parameter from 1.75 to 1.76, it will run away and become a torus. So, so um, I, I would say, I believe that this tor may actually be stable. I'm, I'm skeptical. Yeah, it's good. Is there a final question? What? I don't know. We haven't tested the, the speed of the program. That, that's something. We'll run some benchmarks and see that, okay, we're only a factor thousand slower. That's good. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for answering.